At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. The last episode, we examined the flat highland plateaus of South Lucindo, examining the diversity of life in one of the toughest environments on the continent. And whilst this region of the world has some extreme conditions that need to be overcome in order to survive and thrive, it is not the most extreme environment on the western landmass. In this episode, we will examine the massive expanse that is the western crimson desert, a region that takes up a fifth of the continent and is incredibly low in water supply. This region has nearly no annual precipitation, with year-long intense heat throughout the day and cold conditions after nightfall. The region receives the name the Crimson Desert due to the reddish sands, which are colored this way due to the higher levels of iron located within the sand particles, possibly a holdout from human colonies long since abandoned. Not only is this region hot, arid, and low on water, but it is relatively isolated from the rest of Lucindo. To the south of the western Lucindan Desert is a small band of grassland that quickly gives way to the Great Central Forest, a starkly different landscape with not much of a transitionary zone in between it and the desert north. To the west are the cold currents of the western global ocean, not typically helping in bringing in extra moisture to the region. To the north is a small choke point that leads into the northern savannas, with most of the biota here having similarities with organisms from this part of the world. To the east are the spinal mountains, blocking not only the rains, but many ground-based organisms from reaching this part of the world in the first place. Paradoxically, despite the lack of resources and harsh conditions, the Crimson Desert has plenty of native species that call this part of the planet their home. Many organisms that specialized here have niches all to themselves, but are not usually found anywhere else in the world. On top of that, the coastal side of the Crimson Desert still has a modest covering of plant species due to the heavy levels of fog and moisture. This relatively dense amount of fog and moisture doesn't travel far inland, but is perfect for plants specialized enough to withstand the heat. Some species here in the Crimson Desert are already pre-adapted for such a hot and arid climate, and thus have a larger range around the entire continent. The first species of plants to colonize this region are the descendants of cactuses, who have spent a lot of time on Earth specializing in arid environments, and are perfect for taking this region's lack of competition to their full advantage. There are two groups of cacti in the region, which have specialized for different niches to avoid mutual competition. The first of the two is the giant Lucindan tree cactus, a species of cactus that has taken advantage of the lower gravity of Parias to grow up to 7 meters tall, with segments of the cactus body becoming more wooden over the many years that a single cactus can live. This species can reproduce both sexually and asexually, allowing this cactus to become the most dominant plant species in the entire bioregion. A close second comes in their close relative, who has taken an extremely different evolutionary path to success. The barrel pear cactus is much smaller, and doesn't grow like the larger tree cactus, yet it grows in great numbers across the desert. Their root system is spread quite far away from the main body, potentially over a dozen meters underground throughout the sand in order to find any kind of moisture. It also contains a thicker body filled with any excess water that it gathers, a good chunk of it being underground to prevent access from consumers. 
Another common species to find in the region is the bloodfruit tree, the descendant of a species of pomegranate already pre-adapted to thrive in a place with high heat and low humidity. This tree can be up to 3 meters tall and has a unique fruit that makes a distinct part of the environment in a key way. The pomegranate fruit have become tear-shaped and remain tightly bound to the parent plant, only flung away during strong winds or from animal activity. The bottom of the teardrop is more vulnerable than the rest of the fruit, where insects and birds can easily break through and eat the seeds. When the small football-sized fruits are hollowed out, they can become breeding grounds for small species of birds and insects. The most humble species of plant in the region that can be found quite often around ephemeral water bodies and along the coastline is the spine grass. Spine grass is a common goosegrass descendant that has evolved to exist in the arid crimson desert. The species has evolved thin, slow-growing blades of grass that can be sharp when stepped on and minimize water loss. Whilst not stopping consumers from eating the grass, the sharp nature and efficient water usage has allowed this species to proliferate across the Red Desert. One of the more specialized plants that exist in the Crimson Desert is the much harder to find False King Palm. The False King Palm is, despite their tree-like shape, actually a grass descendant. This crabgrass descendant evolved similarly to the spine grass, but evolved a much different life history during the process. The leaves have become more needle-like and hard to consume, just like the spine grass, especially when fully grown. On top of that, however, the plant has evolved a wood-like stem that raises the plant above its competition. The plant reproduces using primary wind dispersal so the number of these plants in the region is relatively low. The main flowering plant that can be found on the western coasts is the Fire of the West. This fiery coastus descendant has evolved to specifically utilize the mist and small amounts of precipitation from the western coast of the desert to stay hydrated throughout the harsh conditions. They also time the opening and closing of stomata or the microscopic holes that plants use to absorb sunlight and give out waste products, to open and close specifically around sunrise and sunset to maximize absorption and minimize water loss. Due to this adaptation that they have evolved, they are the most common flower that can be found along the coasts, lighting up the reddish sand with their orange petals. A small plant that can be found in the oases of the desert is the crimson sabal, a low-lying plant with bright red berries. The berries are often swallowed whole by toads and dispersed to other parts of the desert. Whilst these plants have evolved to take advantage of vacant niches in the desert, they provided other opportunities for unique clades of fungi and animals to approach the environment and become new species in the process. Due to the harsh conditions of the region, and lack of species predisposed to evolving in such a dry desert climate, fungal life in the region is not diverse at all. However, there are two clades of fungus that have evolved to take this niche. The golden desert fungus is the first of two specialized fungi species that have adapted for life in the crimson desert. This fly agaric descendant has adapted to spend the majority of its life underground as a symbiotic species with the plant life in the region, sprouting from the ground only when the key needs are met. This species has evolved to be less toxic, so more species are inclined to get close to the fungus and touch the spores, potentially spreading the spores further in the process. The other and more parasitic fungus is the beetle-targeting white dread. The white dread is a honey fungus descendant that has become overspread across northern and western Lucindo. Whilst most of the white dread's life cycle occurs underground in a symbiotic nature with the local plants nearby, much like the golden desert fungus, but the key difference comes in at their last stage. When they reach maturity, they will sprout fruiting bodies that are extremely packed 
with toxic spores that specifically target a single beetle species. When a beetle gets infected with the spores of the white dread, the beetle loses control over itself and becomes a slave to the fungus. The beetle ignores all instincts for self-preservation and will search for the best spot for the fungus to grow. When or if it finds the spot, it will die there and be the first source of nutrition for the next cycle of fungal life. The fungi and plants have evolved to become experts at survival in the harsh, dry, crimson desert, but are not the only life forms found in this region of the world. A multitude of animal species have evolved extremely unique, niche lifestyles to exist in the crimson desert, with a variety of different adaptations to enter new niches for a new lifestyle. The strangest of life forms that crawls across the crimson desert is the desert sledge, a slug descendant that has some rather interesting adaptations that allow them to survive in the desert. The desert sledge has evolved a hard covering on their backs that resembles bird droppings, which helps in aiding protection from predators and from the heat of the suns. To keep their mostly moist bodies slick, they consume cactus and utilize a special kind of saliva that slows the repair process for the cactus and thus is easier to consume. Desert sledges only mate when the rains come so their lifespans are typically a few years long so they can live in between rare storms and have a chance to mate at least once. The desert sledge is not the only invertebrate to call this part of the planet their home. There is a small assortment of arthropods that also call the Crimson Desert their territory. One such invertebrate is an arthropod known as the Spiny Runner. This spindly and spiny beetle species can be found across the desert, patrolling the sands during dawn and dusk in the pursuit of soft-bodied prey like insect larvae, or sledges. Their legs are extremely long in comparison to the rest of their body to keep the hot sand from touching the rest of them. Another arthropod descendant that has evolved to live in the region is the purple moon stag beetle. This beetle has a much more specialized lifestyle that requires cacti in order to survive, in comparison to the more generalist spiny runner. When a purple moon stag beetle is born, it feeds exclusively on cactus tissue and will stay in the larval stage longer than usual. An ecological trigger that causes the purple moon beetle to grow up is when a storm comes into the red desert an event that happens very rarely. When a storm comes in, this causes the larvae to metamorphose into their adult form. Females will travel from cactus to cactus, mating with any males that will defend their cactus flowers to the death. After a few months, the adult beetles die off, but the eggs eventually hatch into their larval form to feed on the cactus and wait for the next storm. The Reaper Butterfly is yet another arthropod species that exists in the region, but has undergone unique evolutionary changes to their larval habits that allow them to thrive here. They can be primarily found along the western coast of the desert, where plants are relatively more abundant. As larvae, they are predatory and will ambush beetles as their primary form of hunting. Their shearing mandibles in the larval caterpillar stage allow them to be very effective hunters when ambushing a beetle and targeting weak points on their armor. When given enough nutrition, the caterpillar will form a cocoon and mature into their adult stage, which they will transition from predators to pollinators. The nurse wasp is a honeybee descendant that has devolved the trait of being eusocial. Due to the harsh conditions of the desert and the small amount of plant cover to pollinate, eusocial pollination colonies are no longer viable. Living solitary lives throughout their whole life cycle, these bees will pollinate from place to place on their own, but will eat other arthropods when given the opportunity. 
They may also default to the ancestral condition and attack in swarms when food is scarce. Despite some species devolving eusocial characteristics in the desert, another species independently evolved a primitive form of eusociality. The orange new friend is a eusocial beetle species that has a primitive caste system. The queen is the largest in the colony and produces the young. The king is the only male allowed to breed in the colony, with the rest of the young being sterile. When a colony is fully mature, they can control entire massive swaths of the desert and have a near monopoly on any animal carcass that dies in their turf. When an animal dies near an orange new friend colony, any scouts flying around the desert will detect the scent of death and return to the hive and alert the colony that a dead animal is present by emitting pheromones and rubbing other workers. Workers will follow the one who found the dead animal and fly in a massive swarm, up to a hundred strong, and bully any other scavengers that are there until they run off. Colonies along the coast and near the Great Forest can grow to have over 3,000 members, as a mating pair of orange new friends can last over a decade. Whilst the plant, fungal, and invertebrates have found their own ways to live in the desert, they lay a great groundwork for the larger and more charismatic vertebrates. A massive diversity of vertebrates have found hyper-specific niches in the Crimson Desert, and a much higher number of species can be found here than one would typically imagine. The Red Desert is almost empty, but there are still enough resources to allow for growth to occur. Due to the arid conditions, there is only one toad species that calls this vast portion of the western continent home. The exterminator toad is a large species of frog that can weigh over 6 kilograms and has a massive mouth. This species will eat almost anything it can get its big mouth on, from berries to vertebrates to invertebrates. This toad as an adult will often bury itself in loose soil and only emerge either at night to travel or to catch prey if they get too close. Due to the lack of moisture inland, these toads are only found along the coastline of the desert and in the savannas up north, of which we will examine in much more detail in a future episode. Whilst the exterminator toad has representatives in the Crimson Desert region, they aren't the only species that exist elsewhere on the continent as well. The pilgrim elk is a reindeer species that has evolved to cross the desert, especially alongside the coast, in order to migrate to greener pastures in the winter. In the summer months, a pilgrim elk herd will consume low-lying vegetation in the Great Forest and its swampy western edge. When autumn comes, the antlers grow in both males and females in the herd, and is an instinctual marker to move northward to escape the colder winter. Their flat, velvet-covered antlers offer a great level of heat dispersal when they migrate through the desert, but some may not make it through the hundreds of kilometers of trekking to make it to the northern savannas for the winter months. However, they repeat the walk southward in the spring and drop their antlers on the route back to their southern feeding grounds. The jack horse is another large species that sometimes goes down the coast to feed on grasses and low-lying vegetation. They live in small herds with one to three males per herd. Jack horses have long ears and long legs, both of which help them be efficient at walking and getting rid of excess heat in the desert. They are less aggressive among members of the same species, with males opting to move their ears and vocalize to attract mates. They primarily live in the northern savannas, but will move southward when conditions are especially rough to find food on the desert's coasts. The jack horse and the pilgrim elk's migratory lifestyles encourage their predators to follow them. 
The running wolf is the apex predator of the region, with large bodies and heavy jaws. They are quite tall but not particularly heavy, but use their larger bodies to be fast pursuit predators. They will chase after a selected target for long distances and are often successful in a hunt, as a frightened prey member can be prone to being chased into exhaustion in the dunes of the desert. Because of the lack of resources, packs of the species are very small, typically consisting of a single mating pair and their offspring. The marauder opossum can also be found here, but as their range extends to cover most of central Lucindo, they will be examined further in future episodes. Examining species that can be only found in the Crimson Desert and nowhere else in the world, there is a unique example of speciation and niche partitioning. The elf-eared armadillo and the collared armadillo are two closely related species that shared a common ancestral species that was abandoned on Paris five million years ago, that is, the nine-banded armadillo. These two have speciated due to the long distances of the desert, but also eat different kinds of food as well. The collared armadillo is larger and is primarily carnivorous, whilst the elf-eared is smaller and more of a plant eater. These two species eat different kinds of food to avoid competition with each other. If these two species both ate the same resource, they would be competing with the other, resulting in one of them going extinct. Specialization allows for species to have a good niche only they will fill. The long-eared legget is a rabbit descendant that has evolved a different body type to prop up a larger body size that is more efficient over long distances. This change has been in part triggered by the running wolves, so the species of rabbit can run at fast speeds for long distances. The long-eared legget also has massive ears to help disperse heat as quickly as possible. This trait, alongside their more crepuscular behaviors, allow them to thrive in the desert despite a very small amount of food and water. While some species evolve to move over massive distances, others evolve to move less far. The trap mole is a dread for any terrestrial insects in the desert. It camps nearby cactuses and small pit traps to capture prey. Due to their fossorial abilities, they don't spread nearly as far in the region, but are quite successful in hunting their specialized target. They are solitary for most of their lives, mating when they have the chance, but typically keeping their distance. The smallest tetrapod species that exists in the desert is the tiny Lesser Sand Scatter. A very small rodent species that is nocturnal and congregates around places of water, they form the bottom of the food chain and don't have much means for survival outside of sheer numbers. Whilst they are tiny, they are key for the ecosystem by being food for many other animals in the region. A small species that finds itself in the middle of the food chain is the Crimson Monet a mink descendant that specializes in hunting for nests and burrows. Their tubular shape makes them perfect at invading small nests and burrows, to which they overpower the prey inside and then consume. However, they can often be prey for other animals if caught due to their smaller size. To prevent this, the species has evolved red fur with dark stripes to be harder to spot on the red sand. Another intermediate predator that targets small prey is the white-tipped ear fox. The white-tipped ear fox lives mainly along the coast and is primarily an ambush predator. They have efficient sweat glands that they may lick to minimize water loss. Whilst this keeps themselves clean, it also helps in hiding their tracks from more strong predators. These cleanly foxes are solitary and territorial only tolerating another of their own species in their territory in order to mate. The birds of this region, in comparison to the mammals, are far less diverse, but they have their own representatives as well. 
The coastal roosty and orange bugpecker are two sparrow descendants that have speciated into their own independent groups. They are both primarily generalist, eating what they can find, such as seeds and insects, but have different nesting behaviors and sizes that led to their speciation. The coastal rusty is found primarily on the coast, and they nest in hollowed out pomegranates, thus forcing them to be quite small. The orange bugpecker, in comparison, is larger and nests on giant cacti, and are therefore more common across the desert more generally. A more global species can be found in this desert, as well as other places across Piraeus, and is known as the terra vulture. The terra vulture can fly for hundreds of kilometers at a time, and frequently fly to new places to look for food. They primarily eat meat, either by hunting or scavenging, but will sometimes eat high-calorie plant materials like fruits. The males in the species will be the one to guard the nest, whilst females fly farther to mate with multiple males. Males are very aggressive in guarding their territory, especially when they have hatchlings to protect. The hatchlings will stay with the father until they are old enough to fly and eat on their own to which they will live on their own for the rest of their lives. Another set of species that diverged from a recent evolutionary common ancestor is the snake sandfowl and the great Gurkey, both of which are wild turkey descendants. These two clades are quite different from each other. The snake sandfowl eats reptiles for most of their diet having thick scales on their legs that make snake bites less likely to be deadly. They are the smaller of the two clades, and still have some ability to fly for short distances, despite being quite bulky. They are usually solitary and have quite a harsh temperament, and have a larger range deeper into the interior of the desert. In comparison, the vegetarian Gurki has become completely flightless, trading flight for a larger body size. Being the tallest animals in the desert, their bipedal running gait allows them to be good at running away from most predators. They live in harems controlled by a single male, which gets replaced by new males that enter the harem when the elder is too old to fight the challenger. These species diverged greatly from each other due to their completely different diet, social structure, and general lifestyle causing them to be almost unrecognizable from each other. The egg pecker and mottled eagle are both descendants of the bald eagle. They have also diverged from each other to specialize for different niches in the crimson environment. The mottled eagle is more like the ancestral species they descend from. They have large wings, up to 3 meters long, that allow them to soar for hundreds of kilometers in a single flight. They mate for life and eat anything they can catch, from carrion to live reptiles, mammals, and other birds. They differ from their ancestors by having more feathers on the legs to protect them from the heat. In comparison, the egg pecker looks chubbier, with smaller wings and a sharper upper beak. They can still fly, but not as much as their relatives do. Only the females in the species care for the young, and these birds hunt primarily by bullying other birds off of nests and targeting eggs. If no nests are found to bother, they will target small reptiles and mammals instead. Whilst the mammals and birds have plenty of representatives on the Crimson Desert, some of the most extreme survivors of the region are the reptiles, one of which is the rocky tortoise, a tortoise descendant that has evolved a unique way to disguise themselves. They are nocturnal and feed exclusively on cacti and other tough plant material they can find in the desert, but when the day rolls around, they will dig partially into the ground and expose their backs and backsides to the suns. When growing up, this shell often deforms and becomes asymmetric, looking like a rock in the process. When they dig their faces into the sand, 
The rear end resembles a rock embedded into the sand, and results in predators usually leaving them alone. Another reptile species that has adapted to the region are the two different rattlesnake species that are present, the cinderfall rattlesnake and the twilight rattlesnake. Both have descended from other rattler species, so are more distantly related than some other related clades that can be found in the desert. Both are venomous hunters, but diverge due to their activity. The cinderfall rattlesnake is more active during the day, ambushing small prey and filling them with toxins that lead to their death. When a prey is envenomated, they will die quickly due to the toxin, and the snake can track the body up to 10 kilometers away. In comparison, the twilight rattlesnake is a nocturnal species that is larger and will thus target larger prey. They are more common on the coast, while the cinderfall rattlesnakes are found more usually inland. A unique species that can be found alongside the desert's coast has evolved to beat the heat by being semi-aquatic. The marine monitor is a varanid that has evolved to stay in the water for a good portion of their lives. They have long and flat tails that provide propulsion through the water, and their large size in their adult form means that most terrestrial predators will not target them. Two modified air sacs in their throat have evolved to store excess salt from the water, using a special enzyme to attract the salt. When threatened, this monitor will spit salt if a threat gets too close, potentially causing eye irritation or scaring off the would-be predator. Moving from the coast into the interior, the broadhead skink has evolved a more fossorial lifestyle spending massive chunks of their lifespans underground. Their red bodies are sensitive to vibrations, being able to sense what animals are walking above them. If the vibrations are small, they will attempt to strike and kill what's above it in a hunt. But if it is large, they will dig deeper to avoid being eaten. In order to be more efficient tunnelers, they have relatively large forelimbs with a tubular body. The hind limbs have atrophied, with only one or two claws being present on each hind limb, which are no longer used to walk on land. The most extremely specialized life forms that call the Red Desert home are arguably the rather amusingly named Puff Lizards. The Puff Lizard is a Texas Horned Lizard descendant that has some adaptations that make them predisposed to desert life, but find themselves frequently to be prey to a wide variety of animals. To prevent predation, the puff lizard has evolved a partially inflatable body, with large lungs and flexible ribs and spines, allowing the organism to puff up and expand in size. A ridge of dorsal spikes can be erected upwards when puffed up, causing this lizard to be a lot harder and more painful to eat. The lizard is coated in spines on their side and tail as well making them quite a painful target indeed. Puff lizards have become incredibly successful on Pariahs, with over 14 species across the desert. They eat insects mainly, but will also eat carrion, rodents, and vegetation when given the chance. The most derived and dangerous species of puff lizard is the puff walla, which has taken the inflatable nature of their ancestors and taken it to an extreme. An active set of enzymes in the puffwalla are generated to produce toxins that make the animal extremely poisonous. Not only do they gain toxins by producing them on their own, but they will incorporate the venom from insects they eat, allowing them to eventually become a toxic cocktail of poisons that can be deadly for any predator to eat. Due to this extreme level of defense, the species has spread outward beyond the desert, also calling the savanna northward of the desert their home. This spread has been relatively recent, but few animals risk to eat such a dangerous prey item. All of the animals, plants, and fungi depicted in this episode are comprehensive in the groups of life that call one of the most hostile environments on the continent their home. The Crimson Desert is a hostile place, 
but in the next episode, we will examine the most isolated environment on the continent. Tune in next time as we cover the island of Irene, the only major island proximal to Lucindo. Thank you to the artists on the Pariahs Discord server for helping me in producing the art for this video, alongside the ideas they put in through the organisms they submitted to the Pariahs canon. If you want to make animals that join the canonical Pariahan setting, or just be more informed on the progress of future Pariahs videos, you can check out the Pariahs Discord server. The link to it will be left in the description and in the pinned comment. Also, if you wish to like or dislike the video or leave a comment on it, I'll reply as soon as I can. Please subscribe so you can see more of this in the future. It's free, and it helps out small creators a ton. Until next time, drink some water, and have a good evening.